chapter 2. I want to talk to you about uh, some things that Paul talked about to the church, uh, the people at Rome. Uh, <clears throat> and the things he says here that I'm going to refer to is a pretty good thing that they were doing it wrong. And uh, I want you to notice in Romans, in verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law. So they're, they're, they're calling themselves the Jew. And they're resting in the law. They're putting their trust in the law. And makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, uh, which is a good thing. And approvest the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. And are confident, that thou thyself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. And so these things that they're boasting about, that they're a guide of the blind, that they're uh, to them that are in darkness, an instructor of foolishness. These, that's a pretty good thing. But the problem was they were doing it with the law, with false doctrine. And so they boasted in God. They rested in the law. They know, knew His will. A guide of the blind, a light of them that are in darkness. All are good things. If you have the truth, and I'm going to take three of those things, and I want to talk to you about it. Uh, I want you, I think this is three things the Bible church, a Bible believing church, ought to be doing in the dispensation of grace. I believe it's important, these three things. And I believe the measure of any Bible-believing church can be measured with these three things. And we want to see where we at spiritually. Let's look at these three things. Uh, notice number one, he says in verse 19, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light, of them which are in darkness. A guide of the blind. I think it's the number one thing that a Bible church should be. I believe that we as members of the body of Christ that we have an assembly here that this place should be a guide of the blind. I believe the members of this body, of this assembly, should be a guide of the blind. That is a good thing, isn't it not? Uh, but they were trying to lead people through the law and by false doctrine, which is happening all over the world today. There are people today that claim to be a guide to the blind. But Jesus put it this way. He said, if the blind lead the blind, what's going to happen to them? They both going to fall into the ditch. And so, I want you to see that this place, our life, should be the true life. Turn back and look at what, uh, Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 26, Paul, on the road to Damascus, he gives his account in Acts 26. In Acts 9, Luke's telling about it. But in, in Acts 22, Paul gives an account. And in Acts 26, he gives more details to what went on that day on the road to Damascus. So you have to take all three of these accounts and put them together and you see the whole thing, what was said. Because some of the things that said in Acts 26 is not said in Acts 22. 
Some of the things that are said in Acts 9 are not said over here. And so you have to look at them all. But notice in Acts 26, Paul said, uh, he's telling the Bible. Verse 15, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But arise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things uh, in the which I will appear unto thee. Now some people believe that Paul got the full scope of the revelation at this one time in Acts chapter 9. I don't believe that at all. I believe that Paul, God appeared to Paul on different occasions and gave him different revelations. And as he got them, he revealed the truth. So that when he writes, he said in uh, 2 Tim uh, Corinthians in chapter 12, he said, I knew a man uh, who was called up unto the third heaven. And, and Paul was called up and he heard things which is unlawful for a man to utter. At that time he couldn't utter down what he heard when he was called up. And I believe that you'll find those things in the Ephesians and the Colossian letter. I believe that after the fall of Israel, then Paul could go ahead and write those things down. And I believe that's what the letter of Ephesians is all about and, uh, and the letter to Colossians. But notice he said it's the things in the which I will appear unto thee. Deliver thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Then he said to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. God gave Paul the means to open people's eyes. Now you got to think what I just said. You in here, as a member of the body of Christ, you have the means to open people's eyes and to cause them to turn from darkness to light. You have that light. That light happens to be the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice he's talking about the nation Israel in chapter 3. He's talking about the glory of the written law. Uh, notice what he says there. In verse uh, 6, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. In other words, we're not of the letter of that New Testament. We're able ministers of it. Well, what is it? He said, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Then we're ministers of the Spirit of that New Testament. What is the Spirit of the New Testament? It's the preaching of His righteousness and the forgiveness of sins. That's the Spirit of the New Testament. You have been blessed with the Spirit of that New Testament. You already have your sins forgiven. But look on. He said in verse 7, But if the ministration of death, that would be the law, that would be the commandments that he got, written and engraved in stone, was glorious. In other words, God wrote them with his finger out on two tablets, and Moses carries them down. He said, So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, that law. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit of that New Testament now 
be rather glorious. It is. It's the message of Paul. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doeth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. You see, being joined in Christ in His body and having His righteousness and our sins forgiven, folks, that's the most glorious news on the earth. Now think of that. What God has provided for you as a member of the body of Christ. That's light. Go on down with me. He goes on. He said, For even that which was made glory had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. For if that which is done away was glorious, the law, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, now watch it, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, the law, the glory, the veil. But their minds were what? Blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. In other words, what is that veil? It's the religion of the Jews. It's that religion that they trusted in, and that religion had parts of the do's and the don'ts of the law. And their righteousness was dependent upon them keeping that law. In fact, hang on there and turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, notice in verse 24. Deuteronomy 6, 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it, what He just read in verse 24, the do, if we do this, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as He hath commanded us, then that is the righteousness of the law. And they could not get past that. They could not see that Jesus Christ said, I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And they couldn't see <clears throat> that He fulfilled the law. And the law. In fact, look at Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat. Uh, Romans chapter 10. Note it in <clears throat> verse 4. Romans chapter 10. I tell you what, go back and read in verse. Uh, let's go back to chapter 9. <clears throat> in verse 31. Romans chapter 9, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, there's their religion, uh, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. That stumbling stone is Christ. Verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. In their religion, they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about 
to establish their own righteousness. How could they establish their own righteousness? By doing the things that God said to do. By the keeping the commandments and the statutes in their religion. And he says, uh, and going about to establish their own righteousness, we have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, here it is, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now, folks, all I'm trying to get you to see, their religion had blinded them. They thought their works was what was going to get them saved. And you have the same method today that Satan is using. Look with me. Notice this, he said in verse 14, back in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 14, <clears throat> but their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. That veil keeps them from seeing Christ. That veil keeps them to see that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That veil keeps them from seeing that Righteousness is by faith out in Jesus Christ and not in what they do. Same veil is over the nations of this world. Turn with me. Hang on the Corinthians now. Second Corinthians. And look back in Isaiah chapter 25. In Isaiah 25. And notice in Isaiah 25. And I'm on solid ground here. Notice in Isaiah 25, folks, there is a veil that's over this world right now as I'm speaking. In Isaiah 25, notice what he said. Verse 6. I tell you what, uh, well, yeah, I'll just jump into verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, Feast of wines of the leaves, a feast thing, uh, of fat things uh, full of myrrh, our wines on the leaves will, will refine. Verse 7, and he will destroy in this mountain. That mountain has to do with his kingdom. That has to do with the second coming of Christ when he comes back. In, in, in this mountain, uh, he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over how many nations? All nations. And he will swallow up death in victory. And Paul quotes that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death is swallowed up in victory. All I'm trying to get you to see, there is a veil that's over all the nations of the world and at the second coming of Christ, that veil is going to be lifted and done away. What is that veil? It's the same veil that the children of Israel had. It's the veil of religion. It's the veil of works for salvation. It's the veil that I can do good things and God will accept me. And isn't that what's preached today? Isn't that what people are trying to do? I can just live the good life, uh, do good unto my neighbors, then I'll make it in some way. No, you won't. Man is not going to get by God. You can get by me. You can get by each other. But you won't get by the Lord. You can fool me. You can deceive me. But you won't deceive Him. You won't fool him. But look at this. This covering is uh, over all nations. Uh, I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians now. That veil is over their eyes. 
and their minds are blinded. A blind man's what? He's in darkness, is he not? Power of Satan. That veil comes from Satan. Satan is a he's a god. Paul calls him in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look how the context keeps on. We're talking about the blinding of their minds. We're talking about being blinded. Come to verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. What ministry? <clears throat> verse 6 of chapter 3. We're ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. What is that ministry? We preach forgiveness of sins. We preach that Christ alone is your salvation. We preach that He died for all your sins. We preach the gospel of Christ. We preach that a man can be saved simply by trusting what Jesus did for him without him doing anything. I want to tell you something. If you had to do as much as wiggle your little finger to get God to save you, you'd go through all eternity bragging about how good you wiggled your finger. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's by God's grace. It's not because you look good. It's not because you've got a lot of money. It's not because you're too poor to have anything else. It's not none of that. It's simply God had mercy on you and offered you salvation and you trusted in that. Not walking the aisle. Not praying through an old fashioned altar. None of that. I'll tell you right now. I don't know who's saved and who's not. But if you don't know that you've trusted Christ as your Savior, why don't you do it right now where you're sitting? You don't have to get up. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have to say nothing. All you've got to do is believe something. All you need to do is to believe. I believe, first of all, I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. There ain't nothing I can do about it. And I believe He died for me. And in Him dying for me on that cross is not enough to keep me out of hell that I'm hell bound ain't a thing I can do about it. You understand what I said? I'm saved because Jesus Christ was my sacrifice. In AD 33, God offered Him for my sin. He offered a sacrifice for me. In AD 33, He delivered up His Son. He put His Son to death. He took my crimes against Him and He put them on His Son. He judged His Son. He poured His wrath out on His Son and His Son died my death. His Son was buried and He was resurrected for my justification and if that don't save me, what else have I God, then I'm a hell-bound sinner. Right now, you realize you're lost? You say, well, I don't know if I've ever been saved or not. Then chalk it down that you're lost. And right now, where you sit, realize you're lost, realize that Jesus Christ is your only hope. And right now, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll have eternal life. Believe that He died for you. Believe that He was buried. And believe that He was raised. That's how simple salvation is. And nobody will know it till you tell them. Nobody will know that you're saved till you look at them and say, I was trusted Christ as my Savior. So if you have any doubts about it, do it now. Do it right now. And mark that date down, this date right now, June whatever it is, 2015 on a Sunday morning, 
I trusted Christ as my Savior. I settled it right there. I just turned it over to Him. And if what He did on the cross is not enough, then what else can I do? Nothing. There ain't nothing else to do. A light to those that are in darkness. Look in chapter 4. He said there in chapter 4, He said in verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And Paul uses in verse 6 what happened in Genesis chapter 1. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's not the light of the sun, that's God's light. You ever hear people say, you know, it's just like a light come on. I've seen it's what he did. I realize it's not about me. All of a sudden, a light comes on and I realize that my salvation is not dependent on what I do or what I don't do. It's dependent on what He did for me and my belief in that. And they see. I remember the night the Lord saved me in that hotel room. A night I realized under heavy conviction I was lost. And I'll never forget when I realized he'd saved me. What a load lifted off in his life. I went from darkness into light. I could call him Lord. I could say, I'll never forget my cousin was with me, Shorty, and I said, Shorty, for the first time, to look at you and say, I'm saved. What a joyous moment that was in my life to be saved. Never to have to worry about it anymore. From darkness to light. Folks, you know our ministry here, it ought to be a light, it ought to be a beacon that's shining out to this lost and dying world that there is hope for everyone if they'll simply trust in what he did for them on the cross. Don't trust in religion. Don't trust in what you do. Trust in what he did for you. A light. That veil, God, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Those that believe are not blinded. They know where their salvation came from. Every member of the body of Christ is saved by the same gospel. They're put in by the gospel. They're begotten by the gospel. And I want you to know there's not a member in the body of Christ that didn't get in there except by the gospel of Christ. A light. We're a guide of the blind. A light to the world. A beacon. Turn with me and look in there. It's so great. Why in 2 Corinthians? Look in, uh, over there in chapter uh, 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're a light. We're a God. We show people the way of salvation here. And we're a light when we leave here. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He's talking about verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? There is no communion with light with darkness. He's not talking about marriage here as they want to use marriage. How many times have you seen people get married and then they get saved and one gets saved and thought, I mean, 
I mean, on and on. He's not. Then they were out of the will of God. I've had couples who sat down with them. He asked them to say, yes, we're saved. And then later on, one of them gets saved. Well, were they unequally yoked? Were they out of the will of God from the time they got married to the time the other one got saved? That's foolishness. You know what he is talking about? He's talking about you joining yourself up with a bunch that don't believe in the same light that you believe in. He's talking about you going to an assembly and joining yourself by that name of that assembly and when they are not bearing the light that got you into the body of Christ. That's what he's talking about. And how many people today that are in the body of Christ and they're going right now sitting on a pew in some assembly that don't even preach the same gospel that got them saved. What communion hath light with darkness? What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The unrighteous is lost people, folks, that have religion. They're going about to establish their own righteousness. They're not trusting in the righteousness of Christ. Get around some of them down there. Test them. You still can, you believe you're righteous in Christ? Oh yeah. Well, do you still confess your sins? Oh yeah. Well, then you're not righteous. You can't have it both ways. My sins are gone. My sins are paid for. Say, well, I'm talking about fellowship. Baloney, I am called under the fellowship of His dear Son. I'm in the body of Christ. I can't get no more fellowship than that. Do you don't understand what I'm saying? Religion wants power over people so they can make them walk the aisle, so they can count their heads, so they can say, praise God, we have 20 in the altar today. That's what people want. You go tell them, tell them their sins is all gone, they're set free. You say, oh, you, if I believe that, I'd do anything. You'd do anything anyway if you didn't, wasn't afraid of getting caught. You think because people get saved that they're all of a sudden, uh, their old clash ain't there? That's why God ain't going to do nothing with your body but get rid of it and give you a new body. Amen. God don't create. The old, he didn't touch that old nature that you got, that old sinful, vile nature that you have. You know what He did? He created in you a new nature. He don't fool with the old. He just gets rid of it creates a new. So look at here. Notice what he says there in verse 15. For oh, what concord of Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their, uh, will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. You telling me that God Almighty is talking about marriage there? No. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, I will receive you. God, you'll be blessed by God. But God said, what concord is light with darkness with the religions of the world? Come out from among them and be ye separate and bear the light of the Lord. So good a thing that Satan uses. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice these people today. Verse 4 says, If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom, he have not, whom we have not preached, and they're out there, buddy. 
Or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Why about these people that preach another Jesus, offer another gospel, and they offer another spirit? Look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves unto the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. They ain't nothing to marvel about it. They do it. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? A lie. Do you all understand? He goes, verse 15 says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers tell me something. Does Satan have ministers today? He just as sure as you're sitting in these pews, he has ministers today, and they're preaching a, a Jesus, they're preaching another spirit, and they're preaching another gospel. And they're light. As far as the world, but the world's blinded to the true light. Why? Through that religion. God tells you as a member of the body of Christ not to be joined up with that crowd. God says don't even. He says shun. He says from such turn away. He said that in Timothy. He said for they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof from such turn away. Oh, they got the form all right. They got the structure all right. They preach it about Jesus. They're adding to the gospel, but they become enemies of the cross of Christ and they blind people's minds to the truth. They'll preach that Jesus died on the cross, but they now add things that you must do. Make the cross of Christ a non effect. We ought to be a guide to the blind. We ought to be a light to the world. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Notice in Ephesians 5. Verse 8 says... For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Be light bearers of that gospel that got you saved. I've often wondered why anybody would be ashamed of the gospel when that gospel that they're ashamed of is the gospel whereby they were saved. Look at verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doeth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepeth, arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light. We're the children of light. Look in Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. Boy, here's a verse after what happened this week. Verse 15 said that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And our nation is a very crooked and perverse nation today. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world that gospel. And the last thing I want you to see, Paul said to the church, we are a guide of the blind, a light to the world, but we are a teacher of the babes. Paul said to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. I'm going to use, he said there in Corinthians, but turn over to Hebrews chapter 5. And I'm going to close with this. Hebrews chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, For I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes in Christ. You know why people can't stand the Word of God rightly divided? And I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Is meat. 
they're carnal. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, a principle that's true in any dispensation. Notice what he says there. Verse 12, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, meat, milk, and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Strong meat belongeth to those that are full age, babes use milk. We're to be a teacher of babes. We're to show men the truth. We're to bring men and let them grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I got saved, I did not know what I know today about the cross. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was lost. I knew the Lord was the Savior. I came unto Him believing that He would save me. And He did. But I didn't know what the cross consisted of. I didn't know at that time that God had took all of my unrighteousness and put them on Christ. Those things I learned later. I didn't know about me being a new creature. I didn't know about all of my sins were forgiven. I just knew I was lost and wanted to be saved. All of these other things came later. I begin to grow. And that's what church is about. That's why it's important to come so that you can feed on the Word of God and grow and know what the cross did and your children can hear the gospel and be saved and then grow in the things of the Lord. They're not going to get the things of the Lord in the average churches out here. And you grow teacher of babies. Aren't you glad you're saved? I thank God for this assembly, don't you? I hope you don't take it for granted. And I hope you'll be faithful to it. Because your presence is important.